Welcome to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. My guest today is Vladimir Savchuk. He is the lead pastor of Hungry Gen Church in Washington. He leads an annual Raise to Deliver conference, which attracts thousands from all over the globe. He leads three different internships. He is a speaker, author, podcaster, and his latest book, Fight Back, Moving from Deliverance to Dominion. I'm so excited he's here. Welcome to the show, Vlad. How are you doing today? I'm doing better than I deserve. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to be in with you. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, I first heard about you on Isaiah Saldivar's podcast, and I got to meet him recently at a, at a conference here in, in Arizona and um, just loved what you had to say and have been following you on, on social medias. You know, we've interacted on TikTok here and there, and, and we both have a, a Charisma podcast, uh, you know, uh, podcast. So that, that's cool to see you on, on there, too. I listen to your podcast and, and you're doing a lot. So uh, tell us a little bit about just, um, you know, kind of your your story, how you got to where you are today and, and what God's doing in your life. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate you as well. Appreciate you taking the message, breaking them down for Instagram reels and, and TikTok uh, <laughs> uh, feed. You're populating my feed as well. Awesome. <laughs> so, and uh, you're doing God. a great, great job and with this podcast and uh, praise God for the new season of your life that you're uh, embarking on. I was born in the Ukraine um, to a family of um, uh, two brothers and two sisters. I grew up in a Christian Pentecostal home, but um, because of my birth uh, problem, as you probably, if you, uh, those of you who are watching, if you can't see uh, on the podcast, uh, one of my uh, eyelids is a little bit um, weaker than the other one. And so because of that, I struggled with extreme insecurities. It had to do with my birth that this problem happened. I had two eye surgeries, not to fix my vision, but to fix my, honestly, to fix my appearance so that I could feel better about myself as a teenager. Uh, it got to a pretty, pretty bad place at the age of 13 where I, I despised the life. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to do nothing with... Um, Honestly, even probably with the Lord, because I was really disappointed that God let that happen. And um, I know that taking your own life is really bad. So uh, that wasn't my option. So I would close myself in the, in the room after high school, after my classes. And for 30, 40 minutes, honestly, just whine, complain and weep to God why he made me. Da, 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 da. And so and then I started to honestly encounter his presence in a very real and tangible way. Now, I went to church all my life, twice on Sunday, once on Tuesday. Or on Thursday, and so so a church a Bible. I've read it many times uh, because that's the only thing we were allowed to do in a very strict conservative Pentecostal home. There was no TV, there was no telephone. We we're not allowed to play sports, and just just the Bible. So I read it. So I was not a stranger. I was familiar with the things of God, but I didn't know God Himself, and I had a personal, real, authentic, um, I guess, encounter with Him that it changed my heart, it changed my perspective on my physical appearance on myself. I still have exactly the same body, but things on the inside changed. I encountered the Lord. And from there, that's when I felt the call into ministry. I wasn't seeking ministry. I was honestly trying to get out of my insecure hole that I was in. And, um, and then I became the, lead pastor, uh, the youth pastor at the age of 16, also kind of fell into place. I wasn't looking for the position. The guy before me quit, and so there was nobody else to take the place. And uh, and I was a youth pastor for about uh, 14 years. And at the age of 30, our youth group uh, quadrupled of the size of the church. And so I got um, uh, offered the position to uh, to lead the hungry generation. And that's pretty much my story in a nutshell. Wow, that's amazing. Age of 16. That's awesome. Yeah. Man, God can use anyone at any stage of life to, to spread his word. That's awesome. And and so Hungry Gen now is, is tell us kind of the vision for that. You said that grew out of a youth group, which is awesome. And I know your focus is on the, the younger generation, but what is kind of the vision going forward? Yeah, so uh, the word Hungry Gen was just started. I read a Tommy Tenney book, God Chasers, a long time ago, mm. and yeah. we decided to call our little seven people youth group, a hungry generation. I, you know, we started like a MySpace, that looked like a thing. That thing <laughs> yeah. and stuff. So uh, the church's name was actually Good News Church. And so, um, and then because the youth was involved in like media and cameras, so we, we built a website that, that was called Hungry Generation. And then honestly, when we experienced the revival at the youth ministry and it, it doubled in size and then tripled and quadrupled. And then there was three times and sometimes four times more people on a youth night than on Sunday morning. Wow. Um, then most people started to refer to our church as Hungry Generation. Um, and because we were still a Russian church on Sunday morning, 
Then when I took over the, ch the church on Sunday morning, and we just honestly changed the name to Hungry Generation, but the, really the vision is, we, we are really huge into pursuing the Lord's, uh, the Lord's uh, face with, with prayer and with fasting. So uh, right now I just left the morning prayer at five o'clock in the morning, Monday through Friday. So it's been for years now, mm. uh, you know, really uh, huge on, I'm taking time weekly to fast and then once a month, you know, three days to fast. And it's not just our works to earn God's love or, or anything yeah. of that, but really to pursue him and to live the most radical life now. And then uh, not long ago, we really started to emphasize heavily on the importance of financial sacrifice, not financial prosperity, but financial sacrifice yeah. where we um, not every year, but as the Lord leads, go into radical giving where we give everything. Like mm -hmm. I personally just came out of that season last month where we gave everything that we had, all of our furniture, washer, dryer, my watch, my phone, wow. my car last week, um, and a nice car. And so, and so we, we really practice that. And I really believe that, you know, God meets us at the point of our hunger. God meets us at the point of our desperation. Mm -hmm. I think we come to a place now where in America, especially in the Western church, where we have more degrees than a thermometer, we have connections, we have followers and, and all of this stuff that has its place. But the, the real raw presence, power of God, it, it falls on hunger. It doesn't yes. fall on education. It doesn't fall on connections. It doesn't fall on our influence, on our looks. And I think that it's time to move from being familiar with God to being fascinated with him. And I think that those three keys, prayer, fasting, and sacrificial giving are the keys to sustain and maintain that hunger. And out of that, you know, came the internship, which we have three of them a year where people come from different parts, different states for three months to see God, to fast, to pray, to learn God's word. And out of that, you know, came also the books and everything else. So I really, for me, that's, that's the key. And I'm, I really just beg, plead with God, Lord, you know, never let me lose that and become this, 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 and forget what I came from, and which is from a place of what I'm nothing, you're everything, mm. and I'm willing to pursue you and leverage everything comes my way to know you more. Mm. So that's really kind of where Hungry Generation is behind. Yeah, that's so good. Love it. And, you know, hungry is so important in fighting complacency. And you look at mm -hmm. You look at the church, you look at, and, and I love how you talk about youth because, you know, I was, I grew up in the church as well. And it was one thing where it had to be my faith at some point, it was no longer my parents' faith. Mm -hmm. And I went through, you know, I never renounced my faith, but I also had to struggle with it to the point where it became mine. And that was kind of your story too, is, uh -huh. is the youth today has so many people fighting for their time and their hunger to be hungry mm -hmm. for all mm -hmm. these things, which may not be bad in the right moderation. And some things are definitely bad in any moderate moderation, but, you know, mm -hmm. to be hungry for God is, is something that is, you know, I, I feel like in this, in this new year and what God's doing in the church. And uh, I love to the um, gripped podcast with Billy Humphrey and Corey Russell, they, they talk about being hungry mm -hmm. and humble before God, before mm -hmm. revival comes. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, if you, if you truly believe in prayer, mm -hmm. you're going to do it. And, and yeah. every Christian is going to say the words like, oh yeah, I believe prayer works. And then you look at their prayer life and I've been guilty mm -hmm. of this too, is mm -hmm. I go days without actually praying more than five minutes. And you have to check yourself into the point where, okay, if I say prayer is important, I'm going to do it because mm -hmm. I believe in the power of prayer. Yeah. So I love how you're setting that example. And I love how that, that hunger is coming out of just hearing you talk. Thank you. So, man, we went so deep so quick. I hate to go uh, frivolous here, but uh, I have to ask all my guests these questions. So what would, what's a favorite uh, movie of yours? Um, Bourne movies. Oh, Jason um, Bourne. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, those yeah. Are Jason Bourne stuff is my thing. And uh, definitely I love uh, Jason Bourne. And then uh, 24, Jack Bauer. It's, oh, man. Uh, that's uh, that stuff is like crack. Love that. <laughs> so. That was that. If I ever say my favorite TV show of all time, that's the uh -huh. one I pick is 24. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I remember watching that through college and, and stuff like that. It was so good. And every I episode have, left I have you. I had rewatched <laughs> that more than uh, more than I should uh, probably should have. And so that's uh, that's definitely uh, I call it the uh, the David 300 men kind of a story, you know? Yeah. Every episode left you hanging at the end. It was so funny. Mm -hmm. We we actually watched them. We we learned to watch them like at the half hour mark. So from like one half hour to the other half hour, because if you watch it at the end of every episode, you end up just like you can't go to sleep because you want to see the next one. So mm -hmm. that's funny. 
All right. Who would you like to meet, uh, live or dead? Um, it, it would definitely be Apostle Paul. Mm. It would be Apostle Paul, definitely. And I'm reading through the his epistles right now, Corinthians, and I'm honestly just just kind of almost. Um, I'm f- being more and more fascinated with that man, and just uh, I mean, and I know the goal is not to get fascinated with Apostle Paul, but with Jesus. But but yeah. at the same time, he's definitely uh, coming on that radar of uh, you know fascination with how he lived, how he sacrificed, how he preached the gospel, how he yeah. fought with the culture and and the Christian, uh, the religious tradition of Judaism and everything. So yeah, Paul, Apostle Paul would be the guy. Did you see the Paul movie with uh, Jim Caviezel? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. it was so good. Yeah it, yeah, it definitely put a new perspective for me on on what Paul uh, went through and kind of his struggle too, which you read mm-hmm. about in the Bible. But you know, it it made it real that he was delivered from such a life where he was oppressing Christians, and you feel like, oh, well, he was delivered. He never thought about it again. But uh, you know, those things came back to haunt him, and he had to push them back. He had to to stand in the, his new freedom. But mm-hmm. it still was something that I could imagine, you know, and they, 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 you know, he said he was the chief of sinners. So I can imagine he still had those memories. And it, it's a good reminder that whatever God brings you out of those memories will come back and you just have to stand in the, in the freedom and the, in the, um, the dominion mm-hmm. that you have in, in Christ. So 100%. what about a, a book you would recommend to our listeners? Um, it, the pursuit of God is definitely probably my all-time favorite. I've mm-hmm. reread that so many times, and I'm currently reading actually Corey Russell's "Teach Us to Pray." Um, awesome. And so, uh, pursuit of God. I mean, Wild Revival Terry's "Good Morning Holy Spirit," um, mm-hmm. "The Blessed Life" by Robert Morris. Uh, they shall expel demons. The Fourth Dimension by uh, David Yungicho. Um, So there's I have like a list of about ten of them that I constantly would go back and reread and so but um but the pursuit of god is definitely one of my like that's the place i go to when i get a little bit complacent or callous <laughs> tozer uh-huh yeah I, I just finished his three pack which had that in it uh okay. last year and man it would i had to read like a page or two a day because I know because so like so every deep. word has like yeah. this depth there it's almost like you can take a sentence and just soak on it meditate yes. pray through it and stuff so Oh man. So good. All right. I'm going to move on to the questions. I ask all my guests about discernment, you know, a time in your life, you had godly discernment and kind of what uh, that situation was, how you knew it was God and, you know, a time that you had good discernment and then maybe a time you did not have good discernment and kind of what you learned from it. So we can all learn and grow together. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that my, my first time that I would say that I went on um, with somebody told me and I believed it a hundred percent without allowing the Holy Spirit to um, almost like put a break um, on me is the we had a we had a lady that came to church and this was I was very young maybe 17 years of age our church was 90 percent Russian and this um, American lady came in uh, from another church and she really loved the services she really loved everything and she um, said some pretty bad accusations concerning a friend pastor of mine mm. who was in the other city who I was like being mentored in the area of prayer because I first church I've seen five o'clock prayer so I would go there I didn't speak very good English but you know I knew what prayer was so yeah. I would show up there and and so I was really inspired by his you know dedication his commitment to early prayer morning mornings and so this lady starts to come. She's older, she's way older uh, than, than me. She's probably like in her in her 40s, and I'm like 17. And she brings this accusation against him that he is um, like sexually taking advantage of women, and he took advantage of her and everything. And like it destroys my world because here is this guy that I'm learning to learn from prayer about prayer, and there she comes in. And this wasn't in this time of Me Too movement and anything. So like this was a huge shock and honestly, to the point that I stopped going to his prayers and I was like, man, I need to stay away from this. And I, I really took everything she said as 100% truth. She was coming to our church for six months. She also talked to me almost every day because she called and I was the only church person on the staff. So she called every day. And, and honestly, like I was starting to feel unease a little bit, kind of like this, this is not right. And, but I was so moved by the fact we had an English speaking person come to our church that honestly I was not even paying attention to 
to what the Lord would have to say. Mm -hmm. Six months later, she leaves our church, goes back to that church and writes me this long email, how she, um, let's just say that she exaggerated the facts. Wow. In other words, those things are not true. She's like, I just hope it didn't affect your perspective of the pastor. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Wow. I'm like, I quit going to those prayers. I'm literally like, I'm about to call lawyers and seeing this. And you just simply, you played with words. Mm. And man, that just broke my heart. And, and the Lord dealt with my heart. He, he said, you know, it's not her fault. He said, you can't believe every single thing that people say. You have to examine it, first of all, in prayer. And you can't, their words are not all inspired it's not scripture. You literally took her words as a scripture. Yeah. And, and so ever since then, I've been become extremely careful to not believe everything that comes into my ears, not believe that everything that people say, but to really take, take time to pause. And sometimes by just not responding for 24 hours mm. and taking that to prayer, even if God doesn't give me some deep revelation, but sometimes God will just either withdraw the peace for me or would just bring some kind of a confirmation within 24 hours. So that's been my practice ever since then is to take 24 hours and not to act on what I've heard, especially if it's some kind of a crazy accusation or some kind of a crazy idea or a crazy revelation. And so that's on the negative side. On the positive side, um, I remember the first time that I got uh, inspiration from God to empty my account my savings account, me and my wife, you know, we're in the church salary. So, uh, you know, how church salaries are, you know, they keep you poor so God can keep you humble and yes. stuff. So especially in the beginning <laughs> stages of our ministry. And so it took us years to save um, this particular, this was about seven years ago, or six years ago in our life, it was $10,000. It took us a very long time, Dave Ramsey, baby steps. And, um, and this was, you know, for building a house for down payment. And, and I remember, in a flight to California for a speaking engagement, an aisle seat. I remember it like yesterday. I'm listening to a podcast and a pastor is sharing a story how God led him to give all of his money away. And I get this idea to do the same. Mm. So, you know, and, and again, you know, part of me is like, yeah, go do it. The other part is the devil. You're a liar. Get behind you. Satan. <laughs> right. And, so, and it's that time that I developed this kind of a, discernment now when anything that's radical drastic in my life to wait for um for three days instead of 20 because something like that i don't just give it 24 hours yeah and to consult always my wife and so i of course i ignored that that thought and then i went into speaking there i preached i would go into a green room close myself in the room to pray before the service and it would keep coming back and it kept coming back so i started to feel like man this is from god and it made me sick Mm. thinking to do that like it made me physically sick i would almost throw up because <laughs> wow. the idea of giving up everything that i worked for like it seemed like god would never ask for something like that and then you know i'm reading the bible where god asked uh, abraham and i was like you know what that's brutal oh my god that's just that's just like it really and it wasn't god that was asking me for that it's just i didn't realize how attached i became to my savings account mm. and the thought of it just made me sick but it, god was really removing the idolatry more than the, the finances and and then i came back three days later i talked to my wife and i knew if she will jump at it without hesitation this has to be god because she really wanted you know the new season of our life to have a new house and everything and so i knew that there's no way she's gonna agree to it and the moment I mentioned, without even me finishing the sentence, she's like, let's do it. Wow. She's like, we didn't have children at this time. She's like, let's, let's do something radical for God. And I was like, babe, this is not like, I mean, I'm talking, <laughs> we're not going to have money, okay? And yeah. stuff. you're not coming back. And the idea of a house, forget about that. Only house we're going to have is right there in heaven. <laughs> and so um, it was the best decision we've made. Our life, this was really the tipping point that changed everything in our youth group. We had 30, 40 kids for 10 years. Within about four months, things changed completely in our youth ministry. Things changed in our finances. My honorariums changed. My trips changed. This is where a year later after that, God gave me the idea for the book. And things really changed. So when I look back, I'm like, I'm so glad that I didn't talk myself out. But I'm also so glad that I gave it some time, prayerfully considered it. And then I consulted my wife. And then I did the, the hard decision, which is honestly to take the step and to risk it. 
uh, for uh, what I felt God was leading me to do. Man, those are those are great. You had all the steps of discernment in that story, and I love that because you you waited on the Lord. You had that peace that passes all understanding, and you took a godly counsel with your wife. and And those are things I talk about. You know, look at the Bible, look at what the Holy Spirit leads you in, and look at godly counsel. And you know, it's not something that. And and the thing with discernment and making decisions is that it's up to us to walk in faith in what God's calling us to do. You're not yeah. going to preach from the stage that everyone needs to give ten thousand dollars because that's oh. not everyone's story. That was specific for you and the decisions we make are specific for us in in the fact that we have to be faithful and we can't look at well well, what's everyone else doing? You know, is, is everyone doing this? Is my pastor telling me to do this? Well, no, yeah. maybe that is something that, you know, and there was no condemnation if you didn't do it, but there was no. such a blessing that comes yeah. when you actually yeah. walk. It's, in, you know, if you remember, and I'm being reminded of the story of Pharaoh, when Pharaoh did exactly what Israel did by faith, Pharaoh drowned in the place where Israel experienced the greatest miracle. Come on. And so yep. I always tell people that if you imitate someone's act mm-hmm. of faith, without imitating the faith that produced those works Mm -hmm. because the way that someone else's faith will produce different kind of works like for example we know that generally speaking god wants us to live generous lives he wants us to live prayerful lives he wants us to live uh, fasting the amounts the times and the the way that's going to be expressed in our life is going to be different some people by faith walk through the water the, the, the sea split. Jesus, by faith, walked on the water. And Paul, by faith, he swam through the water, you know, holding on to pieces. And so you can't say that Paul had less faith than, than Moses, but the expression of their faith was different. And so, and I really had to learn because I, there, there were seasons I almost made few mistakes because I was so in, in awe of how the Lord used somebody. And I was like, man, this is what I need to do. And the Lord corrected me. He's like, you're, you're copying their act of faith instead of copying the faith that they have. Mm. Because if you copy the faith they have, the passion they have for the Lord, the trust they have in God, then that trust will lead you to something different. Because you live in a different zip code. You live in a different time time season. Yeah. And you are also a very different person than from them. And so, and this is what I kind of realized is that when we allow the relationship with God to lead us to risks, our relationship with God, not someone else's relationship with God, then those risks will always lead to reward. Yeah. When we don't have a relationship with God as a foundation and we copy someone's risk that they took for God, it will always lead to recklessness, which will lead to ruin. And awesome. then we end up with financial problems. We end up with spiritual problems. We end up with church problems, church splits, because we are copying this pastor, this leader, who this idea works perfectly in them. Instead yeah. of copying the foundation, which is a relationship with God that led them to the risk and then led them to that reward. We simply ignore the foundation and we go quickly into that risk. We're like Pharaoh, blindly yeah. following Israel. It's like, well, it works for them. It's going to work for me. <laughs> and next thing you know, we get flooded with the Red yeah. Sea. And we're like, well, why? We know why it's not working? Because every time that risk is not both born out of relationship, it will lead leads to recklessness and to ruin. Yeah, we want the promotion without the process to get there. And we have to we have to know that the journey is is for us and not to to cheat the steps. And I, I think too about the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and Jesus said, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. He didn't say that to anyone else that we know of. That wasn't a requirement yeah. to follow Jesus, but Jesus knew his heart that yeah. he he needed to give that up in order to follow him because it had a grip on him. And that's what you were mm-hmm. saying is that those were specific steps just for him. And, and, and the people that say like, oh, I read the verse, I'm going to sell everything I have and get to the poor. That's mm-hmm. going to be a waste if God's not calling you to do it. That's You're just true. doing it in order to gain favor when mm-hmm. you God was looking for him to get rid of something that was that was holding on to him. So, mm-hmm. and sometimes so you know, uh, you know, I had a, a situation. We sold our second. Uh, I really felt the Lord led me to give. I had two rental properties at the time, and I felt like the Lord led me to give the first rental property sell, and I had it for ten years to sell everything that I had from the rental property and to give it away. And then the second rental property to give a percentage, I think it was like 20% or something. And so, uh, so we sell the second rental property and, um, and we had a $30,000 uh, um, of, uh, of profit from it. And I turned 30 years of age. So I get this like brilliant idea. I was on our vacation to give 30,000 on my 30th birthday. So I tell my <laughs> wife, I'm like, babe, how awesome would that be? And she rebuked me and she's like, are you doing this because the Lord is telling you? Or are you doing this so you can have something to share in your sermon? Because wow. if you are doing it for the story in the sermon, she's like, it's a very expensive story. Yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> man it, just, it just zapped me out. I was like, you know, you're right. I don't think this is from God. So. Wow, that's so good. Love that. 
So I want to move on to your book. So your, your, your book, Break Free, you talk about breaking out of bondage and discovering true freedom. You also address the role that curses and demons play in keeping people from truly breaking free. So talk about how Christians can have discernment about the spiritual world. This is something that's often ignored and not discussed. And it's something that you talk about a lot. And that's what I love is because, you know, as Christians reading the Bible, you, you, you know, demons exist. You know that it's, mm -hmm. it's a real thing, that the spiritual warfare is real, even if we don't see it with our natural eyes. And, you know, there's a difference between, you know, you, you, not, you don't see it in America as much as you do in maybe a third world country, but mm -hmm. that, I think that's a tactic of the enemy to be, to be hidden, to, to not want to come out in the open, especially mm -hmm. among uh, churches that may not be moving in God. And so just generally talk about how Christians can have discernment about uh, the spiritual battle that we're in and, and not ignoring it as well. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, where did that come from for me is that I, I became exposed to pornography at the age of 12. And then at the age of um, 15, about 15 or 14 and a half, uh, it was my second exposure to pornography here in the United States. And something entered me. Now, I can at that time, I did not know what, what the, I just simply thought it was a surge of um, lust or something like that. But I didn't have theological explanation for it. I was very young in the Lord. Um, the only thing that I knew is that I repented. I apologized. I um, told my pastor about it. He prayed for me. And once a month, no matter what I did, I would fall back into pornography. And this was the time in the age when there was no internet. We had to have a dial-up internet. So like, it wasn't like it is today where honestly pornography is very hard to ignore, actually. Yeah. It's not easy to find. It was very difficult to find at the time. There was no, you know, um, we didn't have a television uh, in our house. Even at the time, I had no computer internet. And once a month, I would find it somehow. It would find me. Mm. And so I battled with it for about two years. And once a month, no matter what I tried to do, and I already joined ministry. I already started to preach at the church. I already started to uh, be a youth leader. I wasn't a youth, uh, like in charge of the youth at the time yet. And um, a Jack Hayford's book came across. Um, I forgot the name of the book now. And he, he talked when he ministered to one pastor who dealt with sexual immorality and he was already a pastor and then certain things resurfaced later on in his years and Jack Hayford started to pray for him and while praying for him the Lord gave him a vision that there was an open door of something that happened in his before he came to Christ mm -hmm. you know and I come from that perspective that if you come to Christ everything in the past is over you know everything is redeemed everything is done you know all of your sins are covered and all of the curses are done you know uh, you can't have demons and 100 percent and so so I'm reading this and I'm like, uh, this is, you know, this is kind of messing with my uh, theology, but it's not messing with my life because I'm seeing a problem, you know? So here's, I have a theology and here I have a reality that that's honestly not consistent with my theology. And so no matter how much I try to say, well, I don't believe in this stuff. My reality speaks of the opposite. And so um, as I finished reading the book, I honestly had a, like a light bulb that went in that that, um, that I have opened the door to uh, the enemy at the first exposure of pornography. And the second time I was exposed to pornography, it was almost like my back, um, the back door of my house. The front door was the first time and the back door of my house was the second time. And, and every time I repent, I pretty much get the enemy out, but he still has the keys to my house mm. so that I have to kind of renounce it. And, and so that became such a huge, like, uh, like a shock to me that, I remember I went for a seven day fast just on water. It was the easiest seven day fast I ever did because I was so fed up and tired of having this addiction in my life. And, and I can't say that I, you know, I manifested or something happened. I didn't feel even something leave me. The only thing that I felt is I, I knew something changed. Mm. That, that just, that just all. And then the results were there because the temptation was still there that time of the month. It was still there. The only thing is that there was this almost like 1% grace that I lack to, to almost like I'm feeling like I'm about to be tempted to walk away from the computer or walk away from that situation, something I did not have that before. And when that happened, I was like, oh my goodness, this, this thing is real. And I started to study a little bit more, you know, the teachings of Derek Prince and, and, and other uh, men of God. And I started to understand that honestly, I, I went through deliverance. And then when kids started to get saved in our church, with that understanding, 
Um, I didn't push on that. Oh, Christian can have a demon, anything. I just simply prayed for people. And as I started to pray for people, people started to manifest. And mm -hmm. those are the kids who just got saved like two days ago. And when they would uh, be delivered, I would start seeing change in their life. And then as, as I started to study more, then I started to understand more that, you know, the Bible does use more word demonized than demon possessed and demon oppressed. And so, and it simply means that a, a person can be under a control in a certain area of their life, not necessarily owned by a demon or, but the demon has an access, not necessarily control. And then when I had a real estate property where I had renters living in my own house or in the, in the, uh, like a duplex where they lived on the other side, I got the clear picture that as I had renters living in there, they didn't own the house, but they had the keys and they had a contract with me to occupy the house. But at any moment, I could have removed them if I wanted to uh, by simply telling them to go or if it required more help that I could hire lawyers you know, or police officers and they can come in and based on the lawyers, they can remove those people if they didn't behave or didn't act properly. And so, and I kind of use that analogy to help people understand that you know, there could be a grip of fear, a grip of depression and nightmares or um, cert certain sexual tendencies or, um, or certain things that we see clearly in the Bible, like even spirit of uh, drunkenness or spirit of harlotry that could have access to a person's life. And, and it's not just enough to say, well, I'm going to ignore it, pretend that it doesn't exist because I believe in Jesus and all of those things are over. Well, theologically and positionally, yes, you are seated in Christ, you are a new creation, you are joyful, but you, you still have temptations, you still have tendencies, you still have habits, you still have hurts. If you were abused, just because you get saved, it doesn't mean it just went away. You still right. have to sometimes deal with it um, and bring it to the cross and get mm. counseling and, um, and all of that, get in, inner healing. And so, so that's where kind of that uh, comes in. Uh, for me, I personally experienced that my wife experienced that when we got married, she had extreme nightmares. I mean, I'm talking about every other night for about a year and a half. It, it made our life hell on earth. It was extremely difficult and it, it was demonic. I mean, we, and I, I already did the deliverance and I prayed, we, we did the stuff, we renounced and everything. And for her, um, her deliverance didn't come necessarily through deliverance prayer. It came through breaking down strongholds. Because, you know, demons, they're cast out. Strongholds are cast down. Mm. Uh, demons, you know, use the name of Jesus and, and they come out. But the strongholds, you have to use the word of Jesus. You know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so her deliverance was different. And it's something I mentioned also in the Break Free book and pretty much three chapters of dealing with strongholds because I've experienced that also in my own household. And so yeah. I don't, I always say that, uh, you know, um, I, I sell what I smoke. You know, I, I believe in this. It worked in my life. I seen it work in my team. And I don't change the theology based on my experience. But if the experience also doesn't match the theology, you really have to check where your beliefs are at. I believe that Satan is a thief. And a thief is only as successful as his ability to stay hidden. And a lot of times what the enemy does is he steals from people's lives. And they notice that something is missing. See, when something is lost, it's because of your negligence. Mm -hmm. You're passive. But when something is stolen, it's not because of your negligence. Usually it's because there's a thief. And you have to catch a thief in order right. to restore that. And so if you're constantly noticing as a person, maybe you're listening right now or watching, and you're noticing that peace is stolen, joy is stolen, your freedom is stolen, and you pray the prayer, you confess that you have an accountability partner, um, my goal is not to convince you you have a demon. My goal is to convince you is that you probably have a thief and maybe somebody who has an access. Um, ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you. Don't go looking for an open door because if you're going to go looking for an open door, you're going to always find something. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go digging, digging into the backyard of your past, trying to find some kind of a sin that you did that has an access now, I'm going to tell you one thing. Bible doesn't tell us to go seek for our sin. It tells us to yeah. seek for the face of the Lord. I didn't go for those seven days fasting, asking God for an open door. I was honestly asking God, Lord, I want to know more of you. And you know my life. You know the spiritual world and the, you know, better than I do. And if there is something there, please show it to me. And if not, deliver me. God set me free. And so we're not going looking for demons. We're not going looking for open doors. We're looking for the face of God. Yeah. And as we are pursuing him, we do keep our heart open mm. for him to lead to us and open. We keep our ears open to him, for him to speak to us. If there is something, like David says, God, if there's things that are not right, cleanse me, Lord, purify me. So the focus is not on demons. Mm. The focus is not even on open doors. The focus 
is on Jesus. He is the only door to deliverance. I always say this, there are many doors to demons. There's only one door to deliverance and his name is Jesus Christ. Mm. Man, that's so good. I love that. And that's something that I've seen in my life too, is when you try to manage the sin, you get into a works mentality where I have to beat this in my own effort instead of focusing on Jesus. And if Jesus is the focus, like you're saying, the sin will take care of itself because you cannot, you know, have your eyes on Jesus and eyes on your sin at the same time. And so I love that analogy of open doors because it makes it practical when I think of a house like like I have. And, and if you have a window open or if you have a, a room that we haven't cleaned for a while and there's and we're, let's say we throw all our garbage in one room, that's going to stink up the rest of the house before you know it. And people will walk in and say, what is wrong with your house? Why does it stink? And so, you know, we have to clean out our house. But like you're saying, it, it's not by by going through so many steps to identify necessarily the sin. But if your focus is on Jesus, and that's why you know, I named my new devotional eyes on Jesus, because that's what it has to be about. Our eyes have mm -hmm. to be on Jesus at all times. And through that, the spirit will reveal those things to you yes. without you necessarily looking for it or asking for it in one prayer. Yes. Awesome. So your newest book fight back talks about not just having deliverance, but also dominion over the enemy. So what does dominion look like on a, a practical day-to-day -day level, you know, as a Christian, you know, we talked about, you know, keeping our eyes on Jesus, but actually having dominion and taking the fight back to the enemy as we're called to, and, and as the spirit leads, you know, not, not looking to pick a fight, but also looking mm -hmm. to have dominion over the areas in our spheres of influence, whether it's our work or, you know, our home or at our church, you know, what are some practical, practical steps you could tell us right now that we could move in dominion? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, use, I like to use the illustration of Israel coming out of Egypt. When they were in Egypt, they experienced deliverance from God through the blood of the Lamb. But when they were in the Promised Land, they, they didn't experience um, deliverance. They had to drive out the enemy. They had to take possession of what was promised to them. And so a uh, mistake that uh, they would have made if they would have come to the Promised Land and expected 10 plagues or they expected, again, the, the blood of the lamb to drive out the enemies instead of what they now had to do is they had to carry the ark on their shoulders. Mm. Um, instead of waiting for Moses to do all the miracles through the rod, they had to all be engaged in the warfare. In, the, in the Egypt, they never fought. Uh, they simply just waited for God to fight for them. Um, in the promised land, they had to work with God. Um, in Egypt, you know, they waited and God split the Red Sea right after they came out of Egypt. In the promised land, they had to step into the Jordan and then the Jordan split. And so in Egypt, you know, they just asked the neighbors, the neighbors gave them, you know, possessions. In the, in the promised land, the first city, they had to give it to the Lord. Jericho, like, it was a completely different mindset of um, a dominion mentality. How I see that is that, um, number one is that instead of waiting on God, that we work with God. Instead of um, we... Um, constantly even getting from the Lord, that we learn to develop giving to the Lord mm -hmm. um, instead of um, just waiting, fleeing, running from the enemy, that we confront the enemy like Jesus did in the wilderness with his word. Yeah. When the enemy comes against us, and we're not, like you mentioned, we, we don't go looking for the devil, but if something attacks you at night, for example, you have a bad dream and it keeps happening every single day, or um, you keep being tempted, that you take the authority that you uh, speak to the enemy. And it's, it's very simple. You, you live full of the Holy Spirit. And then when the enemy comes against you, speaks those lies, you confront them back with the word of God verbally, not just yeah. in your thoughts. Jesus yeah. spoke against the enemy with his mouth. Yeah. He said it because some people try to fight the enemy with their thoughts and, you know, it gets all confused over there. And so, but your word of God coming out of your mouth is the same thing as it happened in, in, in the life of Jesus. And so I've seen this, uh, where people go from deliverance to deliverance, they get delivered and then um, they come back, you know, months later, they're like, man, I just need more deliverance. And some people do need more deliverance, more freedom. But a lot of people, they need to just move from deliverance to dominion and recognize that God never created them for deliverance. He created them for dominion. We needed deliverance because we lost the dominion through disobedience to God and through our failure of exercising authority against the snake. And we listened to the snake instead of telling the snake, you know, what God's word says. And then we were in need of deliverance. And so Jesus came back and he not only gave deliverance to us, 
he set us free, but he gave us authority to exercise against the enemy. So sometimes, you know, I like to use the example of the man who was paralyzed. Jesus didn't come and take away his mat from him. Yeah. He healed him, restored him. That speaks of deliverance. And then he, tell, he tells him, he says, pick up your mat. Mm -hmm. Meaning the very thing that you used to be bound by, yeah. rule over that. God is not going to remove the temptation. Like, for example, if you've been delivered for pornography, it doesn't mean that that's it. For the rest of your life, you'll never be tempted. You will right. be tempted, but you will have the strength now to rule over that, not to manage that sin, not to right. do it in moderation, but to completely crush. Like Jesus says, I give you authority to crush the snakes, meaning that you will be able to defeat it every single time that it comes against you. And if you do fall through your negligence, that you don't go back saying, oh my gosh, I lost my freedom. Yeah. To simply say, hey, you know what? I blew this opportunity. I'm a righteous man. I received forgiveness. And now I go back exercising that dominion and that authority. Because some people, you know, when Israel saw the Pharaoh coming at them three days later after they came out of Egypt, you know, some of them freaked out thinking we need to go back to Egypt and reset this whole 10 plagues again, you know, because Pharaoh came back. Our deliverance wasn't like for real because look, Pharaoh's still back in our yeah. tail. And so, but Moses said, no, go forward. Yeah. And so I always tell people that if you were freed from something and, you know, you shared your testimony, you maybe mentioned it in the book, in the blog, in the, in the podcast, and then God forbid you fell into the same thing. You know, people get confused. Like, so was I really free? Do I need to go back through the same process? No, get up. Yeah. Receive the forgiveness from God and go forward. Yeah. A righteous man falls and just go forward. Amen. And so go forward. You don't need to go back to Egypt and redo the whole thing of how you got delivered again. No, go forward with it and God will give you grace in Jesus name. Man, such a good word. And we're almost at the end of our time. The last question I want to ask you is about discerning of spirits. You know, uh, my podcast discernment is more about practical steps and spiritual steps in order to make decisions. And there is an aspect of it of discerning of spirits, which is a spiritual gift. And, you know, I, it's not something that I personally have experienced with, you know, visions and being able to see into the supernatural, even though I know it's there by the word of God, but just, I want to know too, like, you know, when we have a spiritual battle, how do we know it's a spiritual battle versus a battle with our, just our flesh, or like you said, a, uh, a, a, the bondage that we're in that we need breakthrough from uh, and when is it time for deliverance versus counseling and how do we know that and how do you know that when you when you deliver people from demons how do you how do you know that they have a demon and that it's needed it for that extra time if you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it, and it, this is one of those things where there is no necessarily a one formula or one answer that fits every single case and that's why it's very important the testimonies of people who get delivered they can also be abused when um, sometimes you hear a testimony and you, you know people immediately would think, oh, that's exactly, I deal exactly with the same thing and that must be my situation. And so um, discernment is required. I don't claim to own uh, or have the gift of discernment of spirits. Uh, first of all, I think the Holy Spirit has those gifts. We don't have them and he gives us those gifts at the right time. Yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, prayer, but I've had, a lot of moments when praying for people, you would know, like it comes by the Holy Spirit, uh, that this knowing that this person is not dealing with this, with the physical problem, but they're dealing with the spiritual problem. A lot of times you will see it in their eyes. I remember the first time that it happened. I was praying, it was a lady from Canada and a lovely family. Uh, we counseled them before the service and then we were praying for them in the service because the way we pray for deliverance is we, we counsel them first and we kind of go through with them convincing them that they don't have a demon. <laughs> so our goal is not to convince them because if they come here already, they're all convinced they have a demon. Yeah. So, but, you know, but usually we try to convince them, say, hey, that's, that's really not the case and try to counsel them. We, we're not counselors, so we're not counseling them in the area of emotions and everything, but mainly in the area of um, have they been involved in their cult? Have they been dedicated to, um, uh, to, to demons at a young age? Have their parents if they know uh, taking them to um, a witch doctor, a sorcerer, a native doctor who applied certain kind of um, herb, herbs uh, on them, especially this is prevalent in, in other countries. Um, we would ask them things like, you know, have they committed abortion? 
and we would ask them um, and things like they practice, you know, Ouija boards and um, what do they see in their sleep? That is there constantly somebody killing them, attacking them? Mm-hmm. Um, that they have intrusive thoughts because the enemy usually comes in like with a dominance. So we, when we kind of ask those five very generic questions, um, after that, you would really have a sense what this person is going through. And typically people who are oppressed, you would see that they already have done the prayer, the fasting. Mm -hmm. Um, So these are not the people that are, you know, never fasted, never prayed, never confessed the word of God. A lot of them, they have done more than honestly a lot of pastors do when it comes to prayer and being in God's word. And they still Mm -hmm. feel something like, it's almost like somebody tied their hands and they keep being beaten and they can't fight back. And it's that feeling you get when you you speak to those people. And so those are the people that they, they need help with um with prayer and so those are the cases we, we go and we we go 100 percent. we're going into deliverance we're praying for them we don't rely on the manifestation though it helps and we we pray and sometimes we feel um in our spirit that something is gone they would feel it and when they don't we really encourage them to take god at his word now when it comes to abuse when somebody's been if there is any trace of abuse and the person comes for deliverance we would still not deny them the prayer. We would pray for them for deliverance. But I would never, ever end it with deliverance. I, we always encourage people who have abuse or suicidal tendencies or mental problems, a schizophrenia, bipolar, other things. We always tell them to see a doctor, mm. even after deliverance. We've had people who said, oh, but all of my problems are gone. I stopped taking antidepressants and everything. We still encourage them to see a therapist or to yeah. see a doctor. Um, in our ministry, at this point, we cover their visit to a therapist to an 85% of the pay. So wow. the church will cover that because I really believe that um, where that came from is that we had a gentleman who struggled with depression. Um, he was really convinced it was spiritual. And, you know, we, we church, we pray for that. So we prayed for him. Great guy, loves God, came to morning prayers, has three children. He moved from another state to our church for his children. And then he started to have this problem. We prayed every prayer we knew how to pray. We took him to other men of God. We had other people from other countries fast with him. And um, he committed suicide. And um, right before he committed suicide, I took him to a person who had a similar situation as he had. Now, his situation was very chronic. He couldn't drive behind the wheel. He owned uh, a trucking company something would come on him, this paranoia of driving. Mm -hmm. And so uh, great guy, I mean, gold, loves God, generous. We would go to gym, work out uh, together with him, but something would just come on him. And so I started to convince him, say, hey, we already prayed four months. We did this. Let's go see the doctor. You know, and he was, you know, convinced, no, I don't want to take any medicine. I don't want to go see a therapist. It's spiritual. We just need more God, more God. I was like, yeah, but like, we've done everything. You need to drive. And yeah. so um, I introduced him to this guy who went to a doctor, who put him on heavy dose of medicine. It snapped him out. And then he weaned him out of that medicine. It took him about six months. The guy is solid, doing good. Yeah. And we prayed for that guy too, for the deliverance. So he met with him. He was about to go see the doctor. And then he took his own life. And when that happened, honestly, it shook me up. Yeah. I remember I had a conversation with Bob Larson. And I asked him, I'm like, you know, you did a lot of deliverance. And I was like, have you had people commit suicide after deliverance? And he mentioned me two cases and they had to do with mental disorders. And he told me something that was very stern warning. He said, if you know a person who had an issue with things of the mind or abuse, he said, never ever discourage and the opposite, encourage them to seek mental health. And if they fight you and they will, especially the charismatics, they're like, no, I don't need Jesus is enough and everything. Still encourage them because mind is it's a brain. It's not just a spiritual thing. And so ever since then, we've established an inner healing ministry and we became extremely huge advocates of counseling, especially for abuse victims. And that's so powerful and, and something that is so important because it's not necessarily an all or nothing thing. You know, you can't just say it's always spiritual. You can't say it's always mental. There is a balance. And even if there is a spiritual aspect that is taken care of, we're still wired and hard God, the way God has hardwired us a certain way, sometimes we do need that medicine or that, that ability to 
to talk it through with someone that can help us, you know, mm -hmm. through that journey. And, and so that's, that's such a good warning and something that, like I said, you usually see it to one extreme or another, you yes. know, in the church. And I know and a lot of people, when they come to our ministry, they're shocked because they think we will be anti-medicine and we will be anti-doctors. Anti and when they get delivered and they hear those instructions, their eyes go like this. They're like, uh, I thought that this will solve it all. Yeah. I was like, yeah, it's solved the spiritual problem, but you're abused it more than just spiritual. It also, it deals with your soul. It deals with your emotions. And so we, we are really uh, huge on that. And, um, and we, because I, I think that it, it's healing the whole person instead of just uh, dealing with the issue of deliverance. And, and, and that's, you know, we, we deal with, with parents who bring their autistic children or bring, you know, children who have mental disorders and, and when people see one testimony of, del of deliverance, like we had a case where a guy had four mental disorders, Bi uh, bipolar, schizof uh, schizophrenic, tick disorder. Um, there was uh, one more. I mean, they, they literally brought a vegetable to a service. Uh, wow. I honestly had zero faith. Anything. Yeah. I was trying to convince the mom he needs to be in an institution, not in a, in a church service. Yeah. And he was in an institution for about six months. We prayed. He started to puke stuff out. Um, two disorders left. Six wow. months later, mom brought him again. We prayed for him again. And then six months later, they brought him. He finished high school diploma. Totally different guy. Gained wow. weight. He's now a youth pastor in Denver. Wow. Great. And so people hear that. And so they immediately would say, well, that's, oh, that's exactly what my kid is going through. And so they would come in and they were like, man, this is, but honestly, like, we tried to discourage that mom from deliverance and stuff. So it wasn't our faith. And so there are cases where it's not always spiritual and we have to be very careful that we don't use deliverance as a hammer and every problem as a nail that's it that's just going to solve that there are cases where jesus did deliverance on the guy who was mental in the bible and he was healed afterwards but it's not every person's case. nebuchadnezzar you know there was no deliverance but his mind was restored back to him yeah. you know for king saul he had a lot of mental problems david would play a harp and even though he would feel relieved but he was he wasn't fully uh, restored and fully healed and then at the end you know he took his own life and stuff so so there, it's, it's not a one formula that fits every case and i sympathize with parents or, or people who are going through with with that tend to say that you know we're always are going to pray um but we should not disregard throw away the medicine throw away the doctors and treat them as though like some because i hear sometimes people sharing their testimonies of healing or of deliverance like oh the doctor told me and they treat the doctor's words like like it was the devil said it yeah. The doctor said, I have this disorder. I rebuke the devil. I rebuke what the doctor said. I was like, mm. uh, that, he means well for you. He's not your enemy. He's not yeah. the devil. And stuff. <laughs> so, um, so we're for doctors. I am for uh, medicine and for counselors. Awesome. Man, so good. I could talk to you for another hour, but we're at the end of our time. And so I just want to thank you so much for coming on. The book is Fight Back. And if you just want to let everyone know where else they can find you and, and connect with you. Um, thank you. So um, my book... Uh, Fight Back, Break Free, and I have one for single because single, ready to mingle. Um, they're all available uh, for on Amazon and on Audible and everywhere books are uh, sold. Uh, I also have them available for a free download on vladimirsopcik.com or on hungrygen.com under resources. God really spoke to my heart to start offering my content for free. And so, um, so if you can't afford it or feel like, hey, I don't want to pay for it, no strings attached, you can go download it for free. I also have a Vlad school where... Um, I kind of create small e-courses. Um, they're also free of charge. There's no, there's no enrollment fee or anything of that. You can take them anytime you want and finish them anytime you want on vladschool.com. And so those are things. And every, everything else is on social media. And my hashtag or my username is vladhungrygen on all social media platforms is the same. Awesome. I'll put as much of that in the show notes as I can. And once again, God bless you and your ministry. And thank you for coming on. Thank you, Tim, so much. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Everyday Discernment Podcast. For more information on Discerning Dad, go to discerning-dad.com. Be sure to follow on all the social media platforms. Just search for Discerning Dad. Please share this podcast with a friend and leave an honest review on whichever platform you listen. Feel free to send any comments, suggestions, questions, or prayer requests at discerningdad at outlook.com. Until next time. Keep fighting the good fight.